This episode of Reality Escape Pod is brought to you by Morty, virtual escape games, and Patreon supporters like you. Welcome to the Reality Escape Pod, your lifeline when you need a getaway from the real world. I'm David Spira, alongside my co-host, PG Law. Together, we're exploring immersive gaming from all angles, and we'll be joined by guests who really know their stuff. Today's guest is Nordic LARP creator Johanna Koyonen, a writer, broadcaster, and experienced designer who specializes in designing for trust and safety in participatory experiences. She has created some of the wildest immersive games that I've heard of, including a canonical Vampire the Masquerade LARP that was set within the European Parliament. Welcome, Johanna. Thank you very much. And I should say directly that I was only an executive producer on that one. You'll be hearing a lot of names uh, of designers, and I'm sure we're going to come back to that, and I'll, I'll state them then. I get the impression that a lot of Nordic LARP is really just collaboration, both between the creators themselves and the players. Yes. And I think the longer we've thought about this in a structured way, this medium, which in my case is just a few weeks ago, I, I got a message from someone who said, you know, it's 25 years since you ran your first event. And I'm like, what? I, that makes me feel a little bit old. Uh, and also, yes, no, I was in high school, so that does make sense. So a lot of us became players young. That used to be the case for my generation. And then you became practitioners fast. We'll get into why. And then we also have had the blessing of this international community of people getting together to talk about LARP from very early on. I've been going every year since 1998 to this one conference that we have. And it's weird because it feels like we're still learning. And the more we learn, the simpler it gets. And basically <laughs> what we're learning now is that everything is about co-creation. And that's true within the work. If you're serious about participation, you don't get to define like the text of the piece. The, the, the thing, the actual artwork is the thing that happens in the interactions with the participants. I think that there's a lot of parallels between the way that the Nordic LARP community has emerged and the way the escape room community has been growing. So many people bringing so many different ideas together. And what happens when those ideas start to collide and blend and mix? When I first met you, it was a few years ago, I had a passing knowledge of Nordic LARP and learning from you blew my mind. No game, experience, or encounter has changed more of my opinions and ways of thinking about game design and experience design than meeting you and learning about Nordic LARP. I say this up front because I think we're going to have an interesting conversation that might also be jarring to our listeners. Because meeting you was a jarring experience for me, and I mean that as a compliment. Thanks, I guess. <laughs> I mean, but it sets a little bit of a pressure because I, I don't think if I can deliver on this, I can't blow everybody's mind to be clear. But but OK, I'm, I'm going to hear you out. Shoot. Before we dive into this, and I do know expectation is... Uh... Is it the thing that I often say? Because the thing is, disappointment is a function of expectation. Oh, my God, you did this on purpose. You set this up right. Oh, and I instinctively tried to lower the expectations right back because disappointment is a function of expectation. If somebody is disappointed in your work, you set that up by creating an expectation, you know, before they even arrived probably to your thing. Yeah, Ooh, this became incredibly meta immediately. That's my goal here. So is the goal to lower your standards? Do you want to get into this? Should we get into this a little bit? Let's start there. Let's do it. Let's start there. Okay. So expectation management, right? When you get really good at designing experiences, there's a point where you're going to start to feel like I'm doing everything right. I created this piece, this escape room, this LARP, whatever, that is basically flawless. And these participants are just coming here and failing at it or not loving it or bringing some crap that I didn't predict. Sometimes my work wasn't as good as I thought it was. That would be like the typical thing. But sometimes you actually did make something amazing. And the problem was that the people who showed up weren't the people that it was for. Either they didn't have everything they needed, the knowledge, the motivations, the skills, whatever that you needed to give them to be able to play that thing. And maybe that was just too much, like you couldn't take them on that journey in whatever time you had with them on site. But quite probably some expectations attached themselves to your project. And you probably leaned into that because you need to sell tickets. Let's be real. That's what we all have to do. And sometimes we just want to sell out. We want the thing to be full. And then when people arrive and we have to run the event, 
for the people who are actually there. We hate the side of ourselves that reached out broadly or that communicated vaguely or that sold an atmosphere and not an experience, all of those things, because it's too late. If people are disappointed on site, it's too late to fix it because the disappointment is a function of the expectation. It's not actually about what's happening on site. It's the relationship between what they thought you were going to make and the thing that you're actually making. It's what happens on Kickstarter when somebody goes and sells an idea and then the product that actually shows up at their doorstep many months late is a shadow of that idea. Yes, because very often we sell the work to fund the work. We sell the idea, we market the idea to fund our own R&D. And then we're going to have X months or X money or something like we're always going to run out of some resource and almost certainly it's going to be time and time to test. So if you promise very big early on, it's very difficult to know for sure that you're going to be able to deliver. Of course, there's a way of doing this, which is that you finish your design work more or less before you connect it with an audience and then you only have testing left to go. But again, like in this, we are in like micro budget culture industry. It's not feasible, honestly, to do that. That is such an interesting point. I, I had a conversation with somebody about when they have amazing sets and I'm like, why don't you show photos of this? Your sets are gorgeous. And they were like, I want it to be a surprise. I don't want them to know anything about this until they walk in. And I was astonished. But now I see, I'm like, okay, you know what? Maybe there is something to it. Well, there's something to that. But then on the other hand, what else are you like with the, the stuff that you're not designing, if the tone of your communication and the tone of the visuals and the tone of the expectation of the piece doesn't match what's there, people might be disappointed, even if it's the most beautiful thing in the world. I went very early, very, very early in the first round of Sleep No More to see it. And I had the weirdest experience. I had no understanding what the piece was going to be at all. And I listened to the instructions, which then said, I think, pretty specifically, follow something that interests you. What they wanted me to hear was when an actor shows up, follow them. That is not what they in fact said. So an actor showed up and they were immediately mobbed by people. And that was not interesting to me because I'm not super tall and I couldn't see it. So I just walked the other way. And through this, I managed to miss the entire piece. I had an amazing experience, but I got back to the bar and my friends were like, oh, this was pretty great, but I feel like there was too much contemporary dance in this piece. And I was like, you're shitting me. Like, are what? Because I had seen zero minutes of dance. I had seen nobody dance at all in all of Sleep No More. I didn't know it was a dance <laughs> piece. And I was following the instructions like, to the letter. And I had felt it was very powerful. Oh, but like when I found out what the piece actually was, uh, that made me very angry. Of course, that's not <laughs> like nobody is going to have that experience with sleep no more. Like that was just so early. I think we paid like $75 for the ticket. So that's going to tell you like, so it, it's a different piece now. And I think they learned about how to prime the participants on site and everybody would have expectations going in as well. But I think there's the lesson there that is Every piece is somebody's first something. I have been working with immersive stuff my whole adult life. But that was the first immersive theater piece of that type that I saw. And I came in with maybe more gamey expectations. I was very happy to engage narratively with the environment primarily. And that's not where the piece was. This leads into my next question, which is there's an underlying thesis to all of your work, near as I can tell which is everything is a designable surface. And these five words pulled together so many things that I've long believed, but I couldn't quite articulate. Can you explain this concept? Um, yeah. So when you're making experiences of any kind, and in particular, if you're designing for participation of some kind, you're going to want people to do some actions. And the things that are allowing or forbidding people from doing actions or encouraging them or hindering them from doing actions is basically like at its most fundamental level, it's the physical environment and it's the social environment. So in the physical environment, there are certain things you can do and you can't do and certain things that are easier or feel more appropriate. For instance, if you want to have a party in your home, this is the example I always say, you, if you want people to dance, you might want one room that's like a little darker because it's less embarrassing to dance, right? And the music is loud enough so that you don't hear your body moving more than you hear the music. But you might also want maybe some like disco light type situation because it sets the mood or a smoke machine. But you might also want people to talk at this party and to interact in that way. And then you're going to want another space where the music isn't quite as loud so that it's possible. And in that space, probably you're also going to want 
more light so that people can see each other's facial expressions. And the way most apartments in cities are set up, that part of the party is probably going to be in the kitchen, and that has to do with the physical distances. People in most kitchens will automatically end up at a conversation distance from each other, and there are also things that they can do while they're hanging out with their hands, which is great because people get nervous. And shy people who do things like help with dishes or peel fruit can suddenly talk to stranger. So now you see, I started to talk about the physical environment and I immediately messed it up and started talking about the social environment because these are intimately connected. So it's going to, it's easier to dance on a dance floor if, it, if the lights aren't if all the lights aren't on. And it's easier to talk in a kitchen if some of the lights are on. And this is like at its most basic level, this is the thing. And when you start thinking about experiences in this way, you realize that literally everything that's happening in the physical space or in the social interactions in the social space are designable surfaces. All of this stuff is man-made and all of these things can be adjusted in different ways. We talk a lot about alibis for interaction in my design practice. So anything that will give you permission to do something that you wouldn't normally do. Like wearing a mask gives people a sense of permission to be a little bit more free in their partying, for instance, or a little bit more free in their participation. Even at a party where everybody knows who everybody else is, wearing a mask has this effect. So that would be one way of using a physical item, in this case, a physical alibi, a mask to help design what is possible in the social space. What do you mean by an alibi? Yeah, so I think this has to do with in which part of the world you're speaking English. I find that Americans very often, they only think of alibi in the sense of the thing that means I wasn't guilty of this murder. Or sometimes getting away with something even though you did it. And that's closer to this thing. But I would translate alibi as permission because that's ultimately what it is. They're permissions for interaction. But they're also, it does have the level of getting away with something that you wouldn't normally do. There is this artist, I forget their name suddenly, very famous photographer who takes these pieces of 2,000 people in a square in some city in the world and all of the people are naked. And when we're thinking about like social norms, normally you do not take all of your clothes off and go stand in a market square at 4 a.m. in the morning, which is when they have to do this because, you know, otherwise there would be <laughs> scandals. Um, but I think also if you were to come home from a club and you would be passing through this square and 2,000 people around you are standing around naked, you'd start to feel a lot of social pressure to maybe also start taking your clothes off a little bit because that's where normal has shifted, right? <laughs> so this is actually about normal behavior is not a thing. Like normal behavior is completely contextual. And that means, and this is actually really important insight because it means that when you're making experiences for humans who are not identical to you in like class background or cultural context or a number of other, I think, physical abilities a number of qualities, they're going to bring a different idea of what's normal. They're going to bring different ideas of what's permitted in the world at large. They're going to bring different ideas of what's polite. They're going to bring different ideas of what's appropriate. And, and also individually, I think we bring different ideas of what is permitted for me. So like I, as an overweight woman, might have quite different ideas of permissions around my body than I did when I was a very young, very slim woman. And, and I have been on that journey so I can remember both mindsets. And that's actually a really useful thing to know. And also, by the way, if somebody's alarmed and young, I can say that there's more freedom on the sort of chubbier middle-aged side. So don't you worry, it's going to be kick-ass all the same. But we have these ideas of who gets to do what. And that also is a designable surface. That also is man-made. If you have the humility to accept that you don't know everything about everybody and try and listen more and really talk to your participants and also try to read people's body language, like when does stuff get uncomfortable? And I think I also just in our design practice, I think even to ourselves, just taking on the role of somebody who hasn't done something before and just imagine for a moment that we haven't done the thing and ask ourselves, what is possible for me to do here now? What would it take? That's the other big question for me. Like, what would it take to get these strangers to engage with this exhibition in this museum or to get these strangers in this experience to dare to go dance on a dance floor. If you're in an immersive piece that is framed as a dance piece, what would it get to get the participants to feel comfortable dancing? Very different than putting the exact same human in a nightclub where you wouldn't feel like a performer, which you might if the immersive piece is imbalanced in its participation design. So there are a lot of things around that. also just even who gets to perform. And of course, I come from an art form where everybody gets to perform. And that is to say, there is no audience because everybody, the participants are all participating equally. The audience is inside of each participant. So this leads into the question of what is Nordic LARP? Because 
back in season one of this podcast, we had Anthony Robinson on, and he spoke about the Dungeons and Dragons esque buffer LARP that he was participating in when he was growing up and still does today, which is all built around systems, dice systems, or similar systems. What is Nordic LARP, and how does it differ from that systems based buffer LARP? Nordic LARP is a form of a role playing game and specifically then a live action role playing game. That's where the the term comes from historically, even though we've made a noun for it some decades ago. It related absolutely to to systems based role playing. And that's very often where local LARP communities uh, around the world have started. It would seem that LARP was invented in a lot of places, pretty much everywhere where people were playing tabletop role playing games. They would also either invent LARP independently because it's an obvious step to leave that table and start acting out the characters. But also there were some things happening in the early 80s. If you saw like Mazes and Monsters, there were some films like this that really inspired people to start exploring this medium. And then actually the film The Game, if you remember that, which of course became a really big catalyst for alternate reality games, also affected LARP communities in different countries. So it's difficult to say that this has one set of roots, but this stuff happened everywhere in the world and it also happened in the Nordics. But then what happened in the Nordics was that the development path diverged. And that has a lot of reasons that we can go into or not. But the main difference is that if you go to a LARP, what I would consider a mainstream LARP in the US or a lot of continental Europe today or in the UK as well, they will probably be constructed around some kind of a statistical simulation system that allows for things like combat. By statistical simulation system, you mean like I roll a dice and if I roll over a 12, I hit you. Yeah, or you have hit points, maybe it's slightly less abstracted, maybe we do hit Mm -hmm. each other with foam swords or something like that, but maybe Mm -hmm. how I might have superpowers or how many hits I can take might still be governed by like points. And with this, by the way, it has a lot of benefits. So for one really big benefit to this type of simulation is that the player body and the character body can be very different in ability and in looks. In that way, it might even be closer to, to tabletop. In some LARPs, you will start by describing what you look like to the people that you encounter, even though you are wearing a costume indicated somewhat. And in some, it's supposed to be sim- like identical. And yeah, and in addition to like a big rule set, you probably also have some kind of big world book because you want to create a fictional world that enables a lot of different kinds of stories. And this is such a big project that basically you also want the people to come back week after week or month after month. If you're running this as a small business in the US, that's literally your business model. You want people to come back and play in this world for as long as possible. It's a sandbox type situation where you're then offering different kinds of sort of story units to interact with. Nordic LARP typically is not like that. Primarily, I think, because we were always a nonprofit environment, there wasn't a strong motivation to tell the same stories or to stay in the same world over and over. So we did a lot of one-shot events, basically, even when they're weekend long. They would just be like three days or one day or something. And maybe sometimes they're set in the same world, but even then they could be quite different in genre and tone even between the events. And soon you realize when you do that, that, oh, at this event, we were only using 10 pages of that 200 page rule book. And over here, we needed nothing at all. And actually, we're mostly in this for the character interactions anyway. So why do I even have combat stats if this LARP is mostly about talking? And also, again, it's a nonprofit environment. Ain't nobody got time for that. So pretty soon, people were like, you know, we're just going to throw all of this out. And we're just going to design what this particular thing needs. And it sounds trivial, but of course, it changes everything. So even designers who, you know, back when this all happened, were typically pretty young could raise their skill level a lot because creating a really functioning rule system for all hypothetical LARPs that you might ever want to run in the future is a very, very difficult task. But creating a really good rule system for a three-hour event or even a three-day event or creating only the fiction that that requires in some way that is thematically coherent and allows for the actions that are interesting to participate in for that event That is not as hard. And by not as hard, and of course, it's incredibly super hard, but it's still like a doable thing. And you can iterate on it. So you're going to get better every time you do it. And the other thing that happened was we had early internet penetration in the Nordic. So a lot of, say, middle class kids would have been online in the mid 90s. So they would have found out, oh, in the other cities in my country and in the other countries in my region, There are other people who are LARPing and they're doing kind of, but not exactly the same things as we are. We should probably get together and talk. And this is where I I am recognizing a lot that's happening in the immersive environment now, because when people who are doing very similar things 
get together and talk, everybody's learning curve goes like this, right? It becomes exponential because you don't have to produce every event yourself. You don't have to build every escape room yourself to learn the next skill. You can actually learn from playing each other's stuff and from talking to each other. And you can start to see, oh, like, why do both of these things work? Oh, there are underlying principles. And suddenly you have a design praxis and you start to have a conceptual language for what you're trying to achieve. And that happened pretty early on. And then you iterate on this for 20 years. And suddenly the discipline starts to look very different from people who are designing in a tradition, which again, is a totally valid way of doing it, but that's not what we're doing. Okay, so what I'm understanding is Boffer LARP seems to mostly be based around the combat and fighting, whereas the Nordic LARP, do they eliminate that altogether and focus only on the story? I guess you would say that. Another way of saying it is that if it's a combat LARP, then, or like if combat is part of that LARP, then it's going to be a big part of it and it's going to be taken seriously and it's going to be made really cool in different ways. Like they're amazing. You can go to amazing combat events uh, in the Nordics as well. Uh, but even there, I think, yeah, like the story interactions are a big part of it. And I think that those types of Nordic combat event would not be very different from like a very story oriented American buffer LARP. It's just that then there's like when you go into direction of more story and less combat, that scale just goes infinitely longer when it comes to Nordic LARP. Sometimes we say that it's like you're making films or like you become a fan of cinema and you're like watching blockbuster films or action movies. And that's great. Those are fantastic. I love them. I'm a massive superhero geek myself, for instance. But in addition to that, there are also other movies. Like I can go to a film festival and watch art house movies about literally anything. Any aspect of life can be told in some gripping or poetic or hilarious way in a film. And that is also true for the medium of LARP. If you let it be true, all of those things are also available for LARP. That sounds like a great comparison. <laughs> We're taking a moment to thank our sponsor, Morty. Morty is a free app for discovering, planning, tracking, and reviewing your escape rooms and other immersive social outings. I believe in it so much that I have a stake in it as an advisor. PJ, I know that since the world opened up a little bit more, you have been playing a lot of escape rooms and you are constantly on the prowl for new ones. How are you using Morty? to hunt down new games. It's so easy to find new games with Morty. I pull up to the map and I look at the location of where I wanna play in and it populates a list of all the escape rooms that are close by. And then when you go to it, you can see all the facts of each room just at a glance. So you can see how long the room is. You can see the recommended number of people the location, how difficult it is. It's it's so easy to use. It's so easy to find new games using this. And it's so much easier knowing where all that information is going to be rather than having to hunt it down on individual escape room company websites and figuring out where they put that info, if they even list it. You can learn more at mortyapp.com slash repod. That's R-E-P-O-D to sign up and get a special badge for our listeners link and details in the show notes. Can you help me understand the concept of playing to lose and why the Nordic LARP community recontextualizes the concept for Americans as playing for story? Yes. So play to lose, I think probably started out as a joke in the, like the dawn of history. We started to talk about playing to lose when we started to realize um, and this probably would have been just a tipping point from like systems-based. So like the reason you have systems-based LARP is that on some level, you still understand them to be competitions, right? Because the systems, the rules are very important so that the competition is fair. This is why you need them in those types of LARPs. But the less that narrative is about competition, the less sense it makes to think in terms of competition. So it was like a joke that playing to win is in a LARP is completely pointless because what does that even mean? And then people started saying, oh, but we're, we're going to play to lose. And then it became just like a neutral phrase. And now a lot of people would say that's something you do. And what playing to lose means is that my goals as a player 
and my goals as a character are not identical, right? My character has goals that they're trying to achieve in their life or in this situation or, you know, whatever happens. To them, they have some kind of background and some kind of direction and some kind of values and maybe some kind of resources, social or otherwise. And using that stuff, you know, they want to move in some direction. But I, as a player, don't necessarily want them to to reach those goals always. I mean, it's great if they do, but it's also great if they don't. And in fact, narratively speaking, it's often much more interesting to live a story, for instance, where like I really try to achieve something and then I fail at the last possible moment in some epic and heartbreaking way. As a story, that is so much cooler. Here's another big distinction, though, between Nordic LARP and many other kinds of LARP is largely we don't work so much with non-player characters or monsters are used to different terms for this in different places. So basically all the participants who are in the thing, they're all paying participants or, or not paying participants, as the case may be. They're all there on the same level. And each of them has the same right to experience a really powerful story. And if the only way to feel that you have reached your goal as a player is for your character to reach their goals, then the stories become completely meaningless because then we can't have any conflict at all. So for the characters to be able to have conflict, which is necessary for the stories to be dynamic, the players need to be really cool with the fact that we're not all going to get what our characters want. So that can't be the win condition. The win condition for the collective is that each and every one of us experienced a powerful narrative together and participated in creating it for each other together. I might make choices that I know intellectually or subconsciously, because a lot of this is, of course, automatic. You get into this kind of flow state. I know this is not a rational choice, but this is just my character is feeling it and I'm going to do the thing I'm feeling, even though it's probably counterproductive because I know that something interesting is going to happen for everybody in this room if I make this bad choice. That's playing yeah. to lose. Communicating this to Americans, we learned, you know, the hard way is trickier. Because I find that in American culture, success is often conceptualized in a kind of moral way. It's very important to be successful and to not be successful is seen somehow as some kind of like moral deficiency. And there are many cultural reasons for this. And a lot of people don't believe that on kind of an aware level, but it's a culturally present idea. So being a loser, even indirectly, even allegorically, even as a joke, being a loser is a stigmatizing thing. They don't want to play to lose. It's just a term that triggers a lot of anxiety in them. But if you tell people that they maybe can play for story, that is play for the coolest narrative outcomes for everybody, or even just for themselves if, if they're not quite there yet with the everybody part, that works a lot better. And another term that's being used a lot also by designers in the US, I find now, is play to lift, which is lovely, I think. Play to lift, that is to say, I am playing to lift other people's narratives and experiences. I am playing to lift you and to give you focus. And I know that when we all do it, we're all going to have that cool experience together. And this all really comes together because Nordic LARPing, it's not acting. You're not performing for other people. You're playing a character yourself. You're taking yourself on an emotional arc, a narrative arc, and you are doing that while you are bouncing off of other players. But you're not acting for each other. You're not performing for each other. You're not trying to beat another player and you're not trying to win the experience. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. At some point in my escape room career, me and my whole group of friends had a whole turning point where we were like, we don't want to play these rooms to get the fastest time or to win the room. We tell the game master, we're like, you know what, give us hints. We want to see everything. We want to see everything and we want to enjoy it and spend as much time in there as possible to get the full story. Everything you're saying makes a lot of sense. And I will say one of the other things I like that I'm seeing some designers do now is that they give an alternate ending. So even if you lose this escape room, you still get a story. There is yes. a full story even when you lose. And this is what I would love every room to do because a lot of times before, if you lose the room, that's it. You didn't make the time, the lights come on, they come in and they're like, whoops, sorry, that's it. But then a lot of rooms now, even if you lose, there is some kind of conclusion and I love the idea of that because it's really about getting the story. Yeah, and I think there's something about the interpersonal dynamics, like the experiences that you guys are having figuring shit out together or doing things. Of course, I know there are very different levels of role taking that can happen in a room. And I think that a lot of escape rooms give the participants a fair amount of leeway of how like in character they want to be just that you're nodding. Okay, so that seems about right. But that, that, that does make it a little bit harder to design for in the sense that you don't know 
how invested people will be in the story. But generally speaking, nobody's going to be like if you've done it well and if you're a good craftsman, if you provide a beautiful ending of some kind or some kind of closure, nobody's going to be disappointed that they got that thing. Like when somebody comes in and bursts that bubble and ends it in an unsatisfying way and you don't get to close the narrative, close the circle together, that feels like you're being robbed of something because you, you can't get it back. Once somebody comes in and turns the light on and says, OK, guys, sorry, better luck next time. It's over. You can't get into that space that was real just a while ago. And actually, another thing that we do in Nordic LARP to enable us to tell complex stories together is we put a lot of thinking and a lot of design into that magic circle, which, of course, is a game design term that we haven't invented. And before that, it was anthropology and a, a lot of other disciplines. You go into an experience together where you act in some other way. You say, while we're doing this thing, we're going to have some different types of interactions. Some kinds of conversations belong in this space, some don't. And even in an escape room, even if you're not playing fictional characters, like that would be an implicit agreement. Like we're not going to talk about all of this other stuff right now. And then at the end of it, you like exit it together. And a good magic circle, of course, is one that has changed you in some way. And it can be a trivial way. Like we did something difficult together. We solved or we almost solved this escape room. And that has made this group of people like each other that tiny bit more and, and trust each other even more than we did before. And that's a valid change. That's a beautiful way of being with people. And you want to come out from that together and be able to look back into that circle and see it as this contained thing. So if the people who are running the room break that limit and they don't give you that little ritual at the end, whatever it is, even if it just is, yeah, the lights go down, there's a short piece of music, uh, a voice comes in and says something, and then just a moment of breath, and then the light comes up and you exit the room. Escape rooms are cool in the way, like they have that automatic boundary. They have a time-space boundary, which is the basic requirement for a magic circle. So the only thing you need to do is to not break it you know, for the <laughs> players. And then it's also already going to be a lot better. Nordic LARP is consent-based play. How do you create a fictional environment where people are free to act on another and yeah. not have to constantly negotiate the way that this world is working? Okay, I would say Nordic LARP, the body is the interface to the character and the character is the interface to the fiction. And there are some consequences that come of that, which is that you have to kind of see each other as humans. You're a bunch of humans interacting with each other, humaning with each other. And that's great because humans are great at the skill of humaning. Like even humans who are pretty crap at social interactions are still like, basically great compared to all the other species at being humans. So like the best requirements of pretending to be somebody else is that's actually not that hard. The second thing I would say is that it helps to make in as a designer, a distinction between role and character. So when we talk about role playing, we think a lot about, oh, here's this fictional character and they have this backstory and this psychology and I have to explain everything about them. And all of that's important, who they are and what their childhood was like, whatever. That can be super meaningful content. But really what happens in the room a lot is that people are interacting with each other in social roles. And here also, like participants have expertise. Each of us is a child or a parent or a student or a boss. We are in different social roles all the time. And I'm completely capable of switching from customer to employee to parent, you know, over the course of a day and doing it super flexibly. And then my mom calls and I become a daughter on the phone. Sometimes I become a teenager on the phone and we know how to do this. And kind of like LARPing is that, except that the role relationships, the social structure between the different social roles are fictional. Um, and then in addition to that, you can have shallow or deep characters that is depending on how close the character you're portraying is, is to yourself and your biography. It can be very thin or it can be very complex, right? And this is a kind of framework where humans have a pretty high level of expertise to begin with. So if we're saying now, like we would hand out some different social roles that have different relationships to each other's. To be able to start to LARP, we just have to act within the parameters of that or chafe against those roles or rebel against those roles, you know, and then you can do interesting things. Oh, this is a person in whose character they would like to be this person, but they have socially become trapped in these roles and maybe they want to change their life. They want to change what kinds of actions are available to them in this world that they live in. And that world can be a LARP about recording a podcast in contemporary in the world that we live in, or we could be vampires. It doesn't matter so much, but the basic dynamics are similar. like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Virtual Escape Games. 
Virtual Escape Games specializes in virtual team building adventures for teams anywhere around the globe, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So David, I think one of the hardest things when you're trying to plan a team building event for your company is finding the right theme that everybody will enjoy. And so what I think Virtual Escape Games does really well are their themes. They have a lot of really, really fun and unique themes that are totally safe to play with your coworkers and colleagues. You don't really have to worry about them being off color or scary or anything like that. And what I like is that all of their games are themed for a different era. So they've got a game called Disco Dino. It's a 70s disco game game show. They have one called Rec, Escape the VHS, and it's an 80s themed workout video. It's based around an 80s workout video, which I thought was super cool, really unique. And of course, the 80s are coming back now. They have one called Camp Nightmare, Survive Till Sunrise. And it's based on 90s summer camp slasher horror comedy which again, I think it's a really fun theme. Cyber Docs is Escape from Cyberspace and it's a Y2K cyber attack themed adventure. They've got one called Operation Ross, the art heist, and that is a spy themed escapade based in the uh, 2010s. And there's also one called Return to Camp Nightmare and it's a modern day true crime podcast murder mystery. They have a lot of different options for you to choose from, whatever you think will fit your team best. And they're just great fun. I think you should definitely check them out for your next corporate team building adventure. For non-hosted games, one to six players, you can get 20% off using the code REA20. And for your team building adventures, you can also knock off 20% with the code TB20. All of this is available for you at virtualescapegames.com. These details are in the show notes. This actually reminds me a little bit of how Survivor works, the reality show. So basically the premise of this is how do you win in a way, and you are competing, you're eliminating people, it's like combat, but how do you eliminate people in a way that makes them want to still vote for you at the end? And so to that end, we have very physical competitions. I was in one where we're throwing each other off of a boat. And we said, what are the parameters? Are there any rules? And he said, there's no rules. You can't choke. The only rule is no choking people because that gets really tricky. But you can do whatever you want. But remember, at the end of the day, you're still going to go home with these people. You're going to end up, you're going to want them to try to vote for you to win at some point or whatever. And so knowing that everybody just behaves in a way that like, you're not going to really try to actually hurt somebody because we're still people at the end of the day. And I feel like it equalizes when you go in knowing these concepts ahead of time. I know I've always said the survivor's a big LARP because you go in there you're yourself, but you're not really. You're playing a castaway who's on an island playing these weird games and voting each other off. And you're following certain kinds of norms that were vague in the beginning, but that are now quite established about how much are you allowed to address like tactics and like how much are you allowed to show how consciously you are playing this game also there is interesting like layers of performativity and fictionality that both the participants i would imagine and now also after all these decades of reality shows also the audience we're really good at reading that incredibly nuanced stuff and i mean it would absolutely be possible to conceptualize of it as a larp i have to think about whether there are some distinctions there probably are but like basically that's the thing the same skill set that allows you to do that and that makes you want to not actually kill people or hurt people while you're doing it is going to be the sort of basic agreement between people. This is, of course, also, hey, culturally specific. So in different cultures, the level of how much do you trust strangers is different. And I think it's also connected to a bunch of this really interesting sociology on this as well. It has to do with if you live in places where the governments are corrupt, you're also going to not trust strangers as much and things like this. And here the Nordics, or at least the Nordics as were in the last decades, have been like a bit of an ideal environment because, yeah, we leave our babies sleeping in 
pramps outside all the time. If we go into a restaurant, people will leave their babies sleeping in the streets because like people don't steal babies. That's our baseline assumption is that babies do not in fact get kidnapped and then they don't. And I realize that is just not like normal for people living in all other countries where the norms are different around this stuff. So trust, like all of this comes down to trust somehow, right? Mm -hmm. And then you want to interact with people's bodies. And I guess that's also why Survivor is such an interesting comparison is that if you want to play any kind of play where you actually like touch another human, and that's not a requirement, of course, for LARPing, because you can play a ton of LARPs where people are in cultures or in environments or in social situations where they probably wouldn't touch each other at all, or, or they would do that only on the level of clapping somebody on the shoulder or shaking someone's hand then you don't need to think super much about how those interactions were to be negotiated. But I'm, and I'm trying to imagine in my mind, like, what would that be? Okay, let's say that it would be like a meeting of a government committee. But then even there, if the situation is tense and maybe they're negotiating something incredibly important and it's 4 a.m. and they have to break this thing by the morning news cycle or whatever, some of the characters might get really upset and disappointed and they might want to shove somebody. And now we get to the point of like, either you say that there will be no physical shoving in this LARP, or you're going to need some system for how to handle that. This is exactly the question I'm trying to ask you is how do you get to that point where as a designer, you're establishing those verbs and those actions that players can take within the world and with one another and integrating them into the theme of the experience. Can you give an example of how you craft that? How do you build that parliament based game where it's really built around negotiating something, but there may be a time where a player wants to have physical contact and it makes sense in the story. Okay, so Parliament of Shadows was a LARP designed by Maria Pettersson, Johanna Pettersson, and Bjarke Pedersen, uh, and produced by my company, Participation Design Agency, in uh, collaboration with White Wolf, who are the rights owners to the World of Darkness. This is Vampire the Masquerade. This is, yeah, Vampire the Masquerade. This is very much Vampire the Masquerade. And as fans of Vampire the Masquerade, you may ask yourself, uh, or if you're a nerd, which you probably are if you're a fan of Vampire the Masquerade, you may have asked yourself sometime this thing where the vampires are part of like controlling the politics in the real world. How does that work? Because they don't really go out in daytime and politicians tend to work in daytime a lot. So what are the mechanisms of vampires, say, interacting with the European Parliament. And then we wanted to explore this. And the answer, well, one of the answers is also canonically that they're working through their goals. But another answer has to be, if you know anything about how the Parliament works, which one of the designers was working there at the time, she knew very much about how it works. And the answer is probably the vampire lobby would work exactly the same way as every other lobby they would do the exact same kinds of interactions, which is about who do you have coffee with? Like you meet for lunch and coffee in different places, you meet for meetings, you meet for hearings, you have negotiations or you try to convince individual politicians in their offices about things if you can get access and so on. And you come in with your memos and you have prepared very much and then you argue your case. So that's basically the way it works. And then after hours, there's also a lot of this politicking is happening at cocktail parties and social events around the city and at dinners. And that's just how Brussels works. And I would imagine that's very much how Washington works as well. So this small boutique LARP was created for a very specific target audience, which were people who are both Vampire the Masquerade fans and policy wonks. Like you have to care about politics. But the thing is, so much about vampire is honestly about politicking. Like there we can talk about a really conversation based LARP. So it attracts a lot of people who care about politics, it turns out. So this was not actually a difficult LARP to fill. And then I guess the question is, then you think about what are the verbs that people would be doing? These kinds of things that I described in this case, perhaps you want to have a full experience. So in addition to lobbying and all the verbs that are following with that, they would also move around the city. There were some rituals you'd go to to a swanky hotel room or a secret apartment and, and meet with a local prince and the vampires would be doing like vampire stuff. And, and then the question is, what would it take? And this is maybe not a great example, because what it would take in this case is that you would need to get access to the European Parliament, which means that you have to be an art project. You need to have somebody on the inside who can collaborate with you and or, or like host you at your art project there, which we were able to do with a small number of, of members of European Parliament, which I guess would be equivalent to sort of your senators running a vampire LARP in their building. And I guess it's also like it's more of a Europe type thing, I think, than the US. And staffers. 
So we were running the, we ran the event at the actual European Parliament. The characters had to, of course, for security reasons, you have to come in with your real world ID. But once they entered the building, they were in character. And then we had to run them on a very detailed. I, I wasn't physically there, so it sounds like I did this. I didn't at all. The, the amazing team did this, but they ran this sort of very detailed minute schedule because, uh, again, it's a high security building. So you have to know where people are at all times. Uh, and they were able to do these things. They were sitting in meetings with actual politicians and staffers who were playing slightly fictionalized versions of themselves, but arguing real world politics. And all of the conversations in this LARP, like all of the issues were actually things that were sort of on the agenda in the parliament at that time. So it was about like blood bank legislation, uh, visa requirements between the US and, and the EU, like things like that would really matter to you if you're a vampire, this would be important. And the memos that were prepared for the players were actually prepared also by actual parliament staff. So like you had to do actual policy homework to argue argue your case and be in these meetings in these real rooms. Picture your face is priceless right now. Like, I got to show you some pictures later. I, I can't believe that the members of the parliament actually participated. Yeah, no, but you can imagine. <laughs> isn't it lovely? Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing? But like, it, it's clearly this isn't everybody's fantasy. Like a lot of people have the fantasy of being like a fantasy hero with a sword. Fewer people have the fantasy of being like a ghoul lobbyist in the European parliament. But once the thought, like once somebody has suggested to you, this is a lot about like how Nordic LARP works for me. Somebody says, have you ever considered, would you possibly want to step into this world? And the answer is yes. Actually, now that you mention it, yes, I would like to do that. I'm going to a castle next week to be a poetry teacher in a LARP very strongly inspired by Donna Tartt's secret history. I'm going to be like a liberal arts college teacher running a secret cult with like my students. I read the novel in high school and it blew my mind. And that was a dream I had. I wasn't aware that I'd had for the rest of my life until somebody offered it to me and I'm playing it for this for the second time because that's how strong that experience is. You know, so like literally any experience you want, any dream you have in the world or any bizarre situation you can imagine yourself in, I'm saying there's this medium here that is able to offer you that thing. Yeah, so this is basic. And, and, and then you probably want the LARP to be about some themes, but in this case, it would be probably about things like power and control, which is, is very obviously built into both the fiction and the situation. And then you would make sure that the actions, the, the verbs that are available to the participants are thematically coherent with that. And there's a kind of fail state to this, which is relatively common, which is if you build big LARPs that are like hundreds of people performing a kind of simulation of a society that I as a designer might fall in love with the completeness of my own vision. And then I'll be like, oh man, like for this space base to work, we're going to have teams of cleaners and they're going to be cleaning the whole time. And then the question is like, how can I make the act of cleaning floors thematically interesting for several days for some people when there are also space marines who are going out to fight it's harder to to maybe to do the, <laughs> make the cleaning but i'm saying it's impossible like there are definitely a lot of boring tasks menial work it can be an environment or a context for sensationally meaningful play and in fact there's this whole like aesthetic a big aesthetic debate happening in, in my design community right now is about leveling up in understanding that is happening is about beautiful boredom as, as uh, dr jakob stenros calls it which is a about how you design for those like moments when nothing is happening or the things that are happening are boring. And that's a way to rest and be in the fiction. And that has a value in itself that I don't have to be on the whole time. And by allowing some stretches of interactions or situations to be very slow paced and maybe nothing is happening and my character might be bored, but I as a player, I'm not bored because I am inside a fiction that I want to be in. And also I need a rest because I've been doing really intense things for some hours. Maybe I just came out of a ritual and it's an hour until lunch and I don't want to go out and start a meaningful conversation with some long lost sibling or something. I'm just going to sit here and chill <laughs> and maybe like write in my character's diary or knit or look out the window and be in the fiction. And especially if it's an aesthetically like specific environment, and that's also a way of participating that becomes available to you if you have multi-day events, for instance. Before we move on from this and go deeper, in many talks and in conversation, I've heard you say that the opposite of design is tradition. And this speaks to me on a deep level that goes far beyond game and experience design. I'm someone who's struggled with just accepting tradition for its own sake my entire life. What 
does tradition represent to you? And what is the value of design? Maybe also the question is, what is the value of tradition? Because sometimes when I say this, it sounds like design is always better. I grew up in a bilingual family. My parents don't have the same exact same class background. In fact, they come from very sort of different types of social environments and different language contexts. So I grew up with two cultures in which I was expected to be equally fluent. And inside both of those cultures, everybody inside them took them for granted. And especially the people who are slightly from a more sort of bourgeois, posher environment, they in particular took the superiority of their way of life for granted. And not in a malicious way at all. They're perfectly nice people. But I think if you're not from that kind of, I mean, this is not an upper class, upper class background, but relatively sleep speaking, that's how I understood it at the time. So if you're from like a more of a working class or, or lower middle class background, you exist in the world that there are other ways of living also that are considered by some people to be more desirable as yours. At least you're open to the fact that there are like, there's more on the menu. And I found this sort of difficult. And I think in some ways that negotiating those worlds was already when I started to learn about experience design and I started to learn about those invisible assumptions and norms and permissions to act differently in different spaces. Like you could be really practical things. Like if I visit my maternal grandmother, I must have shoes on indoors at all times. And if I, I visit my paternal grandmother, it would be absurd for me to wear shoes beyond the front threshold. So it's already there. And this is in the same part of Finland, in the same country. And I guess it just made it so clear to me from the beginning that reality is just like agreements and it's man-made and we can construct all of that. And so somebody's decided that it's going to be like this. And I was the kind of kid who always wants to question everything. So of course, I learned eventually not to do it to the grown-ups all the time, but inside my mind, that's what I've been doing ever since. To begin with, traditions are often a lot younger than we think. So like traditions that we find in our culture are ancient and it's always been like this. Sometimes they're like 50 years, 70 years old, and we conceptualize them as being somehow ancient and like necessary for our way of existing. Uh, so it's often just like that's even factually wrong. But even so, at some point, some people have started doing stuff in some way whether it's an aesthetic tradition or like a cultural tradition or what's on the Christmas table, whatever it is, somebody made some decisions about that. And sometimes the reasons might even be that some company was just really good at marketing or, or whatever, and then everybody bought into it. And then it starts frequently. to feel like <laughs> yeah, frequently yeah, with Christmas, with the holidays, very much so. But for some reason, that served a purpose. Like at the time when that happened, people felt that served some real purpose relative to their resources and their goals. Those making those like design decisions gave them the kind of experience that they were hoping for. That, and it connected to, to lovely things. And then you do certain things over and it keeps giving you good experiences. Then, of course, the experiences are going to start to charge those actions or those traditions with emotions. So even when the like, actions become completely disconnected from the original purpose, you're still doing the things because they make you feel good because you did the thing at Christmas when you were a child and it made you happy, something like that. And that is a really good reason to do something in a traditional way. I think that's the value of tradition is we don't need to decide, we don't need to negotiate about what we're going to eat as th at this ritual meal, Thanksgiving lunch or whatever, because we already know what it's going to be. And there's some room to negotiate, but largely it's going to be this. And people know how to behave. There's not a lot of onboarding required when people are inside the same traditions. The downside is that people who are not from that tradition might come in with some completely different tradition and, and they need a lot of onboarding. And they, the people may not be even open to that, that there might be some other ways of doing things that are equally valid. And then, of course, there's the ultimate downside from my perspective, which is that some of the things are not just not serving their original purpose, they might be completely counterproductive to the experience that you're trying to achieve. And this is why family traditions is such a good example, because I feel there are a lot of families who are just maintaining traditions that nobody likes, that is making literally everyone unhappy. And you're just doing it because that's the way you've always done it. And that is terrible. And then and when I say the opposite of design is tradition, what I mean is Design is you're trying to achieve something and you have some resources, typically some time and some skills and your ability to find out about other ways of doing something and, you know, maybe some physical resources and humans and places. And then out of the available resources, you 
create some kind of model for how to do the thing. And also you want to test the thing iteratively to see whether it actually does the thing you, you wanted it to do. But even as a first sketch starting, like even if you don't have time to test something, if you're thinking about what am I trying to achieve and what would it take to get there, I think largely that's a better approach than what am I trying to achieve and how has it always been done? Science was pretty much invented when people realized that maybe they shouldn't ask what would Aristotle do, but they would just figure out what actions will have this effect in the real world. And in some practical sense, this is the same thing. Hey, folks, I'd like to take a moment to talk to you about something that I've been working on with a bunch of people from the team over here for years. We've been wanting to host Recon, the Reality Escape convention, in person, in Boston, for a very long time. And circumstances have halted that effort. But not this year. We're doing it. August 21st and 22nd of 2022 in Boston. Recon is happening. We are blending Escape Room Conference with the tours we've been producing for years to produce a proper escape room convention. You'll meet people, you'll play games, you'll hear wonderful talks. It's gonna be a great time, and I truly hope that you come and join us. Tickets for Recon are available now. You can learn more at realityescapecon.com. Details in the show notes. So at this point, we're gonna segue and talk a little bit about designing for more intense interactions. And um, at this point, I'm going to just give a warning to folks that we're going to delve into some subjects around how the Nordic LARP community safely and responsibly handles concepts that I once believed should never be part of game design, the most notable of which is sexual violence. So if this is not something that you want to be hearing about, this is probably the time to turn away. But I will say that I think that you're going to be surprised if, if this is something that sounds jarring to you. I think you'll be surprised by what you learn. I certainly was. And to get this conversation started, I'm just going to read the answer to the question, is this LARP for me from the website of the experience Inside Hamlet, which is a LARP. And Johanna, I've stolen this from one of your presentations because I think it just it captures this perfectly. So it reads... The LARP is played in a very physical style, where dancing is dancing and fighting looks real. Real alcohol will be served, but players deemed too intoxicated to participate responsibly will be removed from play. Convincing-looking alcohol-free options are always available so your character can get drunk while you pace yourself. All genders, sexualities, and bodies are invited to act wicked and be beautiful at this LARP. During play, you are likely to become witness to nudity, public displays of affection and sexuality, or simulated but realistic looking sex, violence, or drug taking. A good minimum comfort level for participation is for you to be able to hold hands with or kiss a stranger lightly on the cheek. But whether gentle intimacy, portrayed lust, or pretend violence, you will always have full control of your body and of the story you are playing. You always choose who to touch and control who touches you. You can always leave any situation and step outside the play area to take a break from the fiction as needed. So there's a lot there. Yeah. Do you want to do it like line by line? <laughs> Where do we start? Yeah, let's start with what Inside Hamlet is, and then let's kind of break down all the taboos. Yeah, so Inside Hamlet, unfortunately, we've lost the venue. So it, it's now been retired, and I have to talk about it in the past tense. Inside Hamlet was a LARP that was run at Castle Elsinore, which is the actual in the actual Elsinore. It's a Renaissance building that Shakespeare was very aware of when he wrote his play Hamlet, even though he set it in a historical earlier period at the time. Uh, and this very famous building, we were allowed to rent some spaces and play in. And so what we were offering in this experience was the opportunity to travel to Elsinore uh, and live in the Elsinore castle, live the Hamlet story for about three days together. And the setting was the court of King Claudius. We had a three-act structure rather than a five-act structure, but largely follows the beats of the play. 
the characters from the play are all present. They are normal player characters. But in the design of this piece, the people who play the Hamlet and all of those, some of the soliloquies basically from the play are performed on a sort of in sort of meta level scenes during this performance. So if you wanted to, to LARP as Hamlet, you would have to have the skill of memorizing enough text. So a lot of the people who ended up playing those roles tended to also have some theater training. But they were also paying uh, participants. They just came one day earlier for rehearsals. Everybody else in this course was like extrapolated from the play. There are people who would have needed to be in this court for it to function. And it was moved to this sort of alternate history, kind of 1930s environment. There's, a, I think it's a Richard III film with Ian McKellen that has a similar aesthetic that was one of the inspirations way back when. So it looks like that. You're in this sort of unclear uh, vintage era in an alternate history Europe where the French Revolution hasn't happened and the feudal lords are still lording over the country uh, when the socialist revolutionaries come and Fortinbras, the Norwegian prince, uh, is a socialist revolutionary. And that's the sort of setting. And we are at the court of Claudius. And it's a kind of like, almost like a Hitler bunker situation in that it's clearly it's the last days or the last months in this case, because there are time jumps in the experience. This, we are playing through the last, the last uh, months of the sort of dictatorship of, of a mad king. If you know Hamlet at all, the play, you will know that it's structured around this sort of Renaissance metaphor of how the corruption in the head of state leads to a corruption of the body politic. And there are some very dark themes also present, like incest, of course, because of the marriages and so on, murder and political oppression uh, are present in the text in incredibly sort of concrete ways. And if you know anything about Shakespeare, this is just the fact. And it's very difficult to make a meaningful reading or a meaningful experience or a meaningful performance, but in this case, a co-creative performance of this play without those themes being present. And then we had to think about then how do you do that safely? And of course, luckily, we don't need to invent things from scratch because all themes are available to Nordic LARP as a medium. But this is a big event. It's, it could be around 100 people. And getting 100 strangers okay with all of this takes some work. And it's structured. The acts have different themes. And the first act has the theme of decadence. And there are some elements of it when it moves, the castle is under attack and you move into this sort of basement and it turns into this sort of burlesque party aesthetic. And again, some of the sort of sensual interactions between some of the characters can also take place already there. And then, of course, it becomes increasingly violent. And there are interaction rules saying that, for instance, if you have conflicts between characters, the outcomes will be different depending on which act you are in. So in the first, you can escalate to duel, but, but nobody can really get hurt. And in the second act, you can get injured but you wouldn't die. And in the second half of the final act, when all hell breaks loose, it's a Shakespeare play. We're going to kill pretty much everybody by the end. So then the rules change <laughs> to if any conflict of any kind that is the starts one, at least one of the participants in the conflicts has to die. Uh, so that's also built into the structure. Why is all that language on the web page? Expectation management, right? It's so important. The people who play this LARP need to choose actively to participate in this type of content. And they need to have a decent idea uh, about what they can and what they can see and what is going to be happening around them. That said, we're not messing around with that you have that control. It, you can absolutely play the LARP, and many people have, with the level of maybe holding someone's hand or, or maybe kissing someone lightly on the cheek or maybe not touching anybody at all, but that's a good minimum level. And some other people will be playing it incredibly physically. And it does have this sort of theater sex mechanic so that if sexual acts are portrayed, they are portrayed in a naturalistic looking not in duration, thank God, because, you know, it would take forever. People are wearing underwear at all times. That's a rule. So even if you get naked, you have to be wearing underwear to engage in a pretend sexual act. But yeah, that does happen. It makes sense in the context of the fiction. It's not anything you have to do, and it's not anything that most players necessarily do. But for some characters, it makes sense. And for some players, it's no big deal. And then it's available, or it's a big deal, but it's a big deal. It's, it's possible. It becomes available for them to do safely. So then I should probably say that you do not get into a room with 100 strangers in character and tell them, OK, go. That's not how this works at all. You have a big yeah. workshop on site. And of course, there are rules and there are, are systems for how to negotiate these types of interactions. And people will have received those in advance and they will have been able to ask questions if they have any questions. And then when they arrive on location, we spend a lot of time together out of character and we spend a lot of time together learning, building trust together and, and doing workshop exercises to be okay to get into that mind space where it's possible for us to tell these stories. So if you and I are participants in this, 
and we're playing characters who are at odds. How do I indicate to you that it's fine for you to escalate, to be more harsh or be more violent? How do I, as a player, give consent in character? Okay, now let's see if I get this right, because it's a few years since I've run this event. But I, I would say that in Inside Hamlet, one of the key mechanics is a verbal escalation and de-escalation mechanic. So there are two code words. One is rotten and one is pure. And if you slip rotten into a sentence, it means I'm okay with this, give me more. If you're okay with giving me more, I'm inviting you to, to escalate if you're okay with that. And if you slip pure into a sentence, then it says, we're okay, but I'm okay. Let's stay at this level. I don't want this to become any more intense. And when more intense, we're workshopping that, you know, we're, we would be practicing that in advance, but that can mean like maybe if you're shouting in my face, may, maybe if I'm calling you a rotten scoundrel, it can be an invitation to perhaps get a little physical, for instance, and, and, and shove me a little bit. There's also some things about theater fighting and stuff like that, you obviously can't use any real violence. So there's some advice about how to do things that look like violence, but aren't actually. But of course, also, if you and I had a relationship where we had previously negotiated, or we knew we were going to have this fight, maybe we checked in with each other, or we knew we were heading in that direction, we might check in with each other in a break, or we might end up stepping out into the auto character room at the same time, and we can have a little negotiation there. Or we can do it very discreetly in the play location, just quietly to each other. And maybe I'll say, you can slap me in the face, but just don't slap me hard, for instance. So we can decide that sort of fluidly. But I would obviously wouldn't slap somebody who hasn't ex explicitly given you permission, for instance. Another time, another thing that is possible to do, and, I, and yeah, and also, again, it's also okay, and it's a very important part of the design is that whether you escalate or de-escalate, it's all of those things are okay. These are all good. And whenever, generally, I say that whenever you teach your people about consent, the correct answer to somebody stating a boundary is always thank you. So if somebody says... I'd rather you didn't do this. Then you say thank you because you have been given like a really important piece of information. They should never, nobody should ever feel punished or embarrassed for stating a boundary. Like literally being able to know and state your boundaries is what enables this kind of play. But the verbal things are not enough. There's also a physical tap out that you can use on your own body or somebody else's is you just double tap their arm. And that's a signal that we need to sort of break up what's happening right now. And anybody will have the opportunity to leave at that time. And what's more, there's a look down mechanic, yeah. So the, it's a hand gesture where you hold your hand um, in front of your eyes and look down and it says, I, the player, am removing myself from this situation right now, but you guys go right ahead. You continue. And it also means that if I happen to walk into a room and there's some kind of scene is playing out that contains some kind of content that isn't playable for me personally, I can just put my hand in front of my eyes and turn away and move away. And it's totally okay. Like it's encouraged in the context of the fiction. I say, mechanically, that effectively just turns you into a ghost. You've more or less disappeared from the scene as far as the other players are concerned. Yeah, but it's also just like, that's not, it's, we're not going to address it. Sometimes if, if it becomes narratively incoherent, then maybe you mm -hmm. have to do some little, some, somebody will say, we'll return to this later or something like that. You uh -huh. might have to do some gesture, but this could be anything. And, and we're really working very hard in our player culture and in the workshops for the specific events to normalize this because there are a ton of reasons why I might need to leave a situation. Like maybe I just really need the bathroom or maybe I just realized if I don't go and check my phone right now, like I'm worried about text messages from a babysitter. And if I don't check the phone right now, I'm not going to be able to enjoy what's happening. So I'm just going to go out and do that right now in the middle of this scene or I'm stating a boundary, but if you're normalized doing it for any reason, then it's not going to be a big deal if you feel that you need to do it to avert getting into a scene that you might not want to be in. But the design of the fiction, I just want to say, is just as important. So it's important on the player level, it, it needs to be okay between the players to at any time state the boundary or extract yourself from a situation. But it also needs to make sense in the fiction. And this is actually where some designers fail because it's very difficult to like, quote unquote, ruin a scene that a lot of people are involved in, or you feel like, oh, but if my character goes now, like my whole story will be ruined. And for the purposes of this LARP, the fix was just that everybody at this court is just so blasé. They're so bored with everything. Like, it's always okay to just, nothing is happening. Like any extreme thing could be happening and the characters could just be so bored that they're leaving. And also the, the king is literally losing his power. So even if the king himself is giving you a direct order, you can still just walk off and it won't have any in-game consequences because inside the fiction, it's just like one more sign that his, his empire is crumbling, basically. Everything is a designable surface. Yes, yes. And again, the social things need to be available for people. It's not just theoretically available. It needs to be actually available for people to do that. So you need to think about what's going to make it for them. 
I had just done a bunch of haunts here. And so some of these are quite physical where they do say the actors might touch you. And you can either make a sign so you can make like a big cross in front of you. And that means I don't want to be touched. Or before you even go in, you can get wristbands that say I'm just going to opt out of any of touching beforehand. So I was wondering if you guys ever think about incorporating some type of physical, you know, if you're wearing a purple hat band, that means I don't want anything sexual or something physical to to say like where your boundaries are do you guys ever do anything like that yeah yeah absolutely and it's i mean this is again like all of these mechanics they have to make sense in the context of the overall design and who the player base are and a number of different things and i would say like fundamentally the most important thing about opt-in opt-out design is that it's not enough to opt in first is the difficulty of communicating what kind of experiences will I even be experiencing? And I think that actually our, the Inside Hamlet webpage is doing a pretty good job of that. But I, even so, if you haven't learned before, you're not going to know how powerful the experience can be like emotionally and in your body, how real it might feel. And that doesn't mean that you think that the violence and all of that stuff is real, because you're not going to think that for one second. You know, of course, that you're in a fiction, but you're going to be feeling emotions that you didn't predict. And the thing is, because you're, and even in a haunt, you, you can totally feel emotions that you didn't predict. So if something that seemed like a good idea when I entered might not feel like a good idea anymore. So like really core importance, you have to be able to take those wristbands off. Like you have to be able to fluidly opt out of something when you realize that you have misjudged. They have not communicated well enough to you. Like what level of horror this is going to be or what level of touching or something. The wristband is an opt out. Okay. Yeah, I see. Yeah, but then that's kind of a shame because then doesn't that mean that a lot of people are going to err on the side of caution and not opt into things? Like, so that's also, of course, that's also a choice. But I would rather be really specific about what kinds of things might happen and allow people to choose for that and then also give them tools to change their mind. Which again, like there might be, maybe I have like a bum knee or something and then I step wrongly on the stairs and now actually physical play is not available to me anymore. So I just, it's, even for just the most banal practical reasons, it's always a good idea to have those opt-out mechanisms available anyway. And then you might as well use them. We always say you have to feel safe to be brave. So to be able to participate, you have to be in this sort of framework of safety and trust. And that needs to be real. Like it needs to be earned. Uh, you need to earn it in your communication and you need to earn it in the sort of consistency of your design so that people know that these tools are actually going to work. This is the thing that I most admire about Nordic LARP is this commitment to fluidity of consent and recognizing that players can't just sign a waiver in advance and agree to all of the unknown that's in front of them and just accept that, you know, I said, okay, so everything must be okay. Where in reality, for most of us, it's always going to fall on a spectrum and the needle is going to move as you move throughout the experience. Maybe you're less comfortable at the beginning, but the more comfortable you get with the space and the interaction, the more willing you become to engage in something. Or maybe you hurt yourself, or maybe you're in the middle of this and all of a sudden you are remembering some childhood memory that is making this entire experience less pleasurable than you were expecting. And this is not a thing that you really want to be committing to on the way that you thought you were when you went in. I, I was talking to a designer who, who's a friend who's from a Catholic country, which he says that affects probably his ideas about like sexuality of the body and things like that, even though he is himself not a believer. And he said coming into Inside Hamlet, he didn't understand why it needed to have sexual content at all. And I said, well, it doesn't need to have sexual content. It's just that it, it has and it's in the fiction and it's in these stories. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I understand it now. At the beginning, I thought like I'm going to avoid this systematically because I don't want to LARP with people who go to LARPs to have these experiences and I was like what that was your expectation He's like, yes no but I've played it now so I know oh it's a storytelling tool like grown-ups can tell stories about many things and sometimes when you tell stories that's a story about a horrible like dictator and the kind of structures that are echoing and that are happening inside a society or inside a community when you are allowing hierarchical power to be abused in different ways then stories about different kinds of abuse are narratively relevant and coherent and that's not like you wouldn't go there to get that. I mean, I guess some people might, but it's only meaningful to do in the context of the LARP if it has some kind of narrative function. And then when he had seen like, oh, but this is a storytelling tool, like a sex scene is something that you play because it changes something about the characters 
or their situation or their power dynamic or the plot direction or something. And if it doesn't, you wouldn't do that because like sex is not super sexy, like mostly awkward. Like it might look hot from the outside, but it's really weird. Like it is pretty weird. Uh, let's be real to have a pretend sexual interaction with someone. Well, why would you push yourself through that if it wasn't somehow like narratively meaningful in the context of the experience? And I mean, there's a lot of nuance to this, but like top level, that's kind of it. And the other, you know, some people would say, oh, wouldn't that be like the world's worst sex party? Because the one thing you can't do is like actually have sex with anyone. Because people forget that these are consenting adults. All the world is their oyster. If they want to go to sex parties, they're right there in Denmark, I'll tell you. We can send you to a totally different address and you'll have a very different type of experience. You can probably wear the same outfit, but like, you know, at least at the <laughs> beginning of the evening. But that, that's not, if you were coming to Inside Hamlet for that, you would be very disappointed. And it's just to say that, and also violence and, and torture sometimes. There are things like this, the political oppression are really difficult themes and we have to take them seriously. And we have players in our player communities because the people who play these kinds of LARPs, uh, the international Nordic style LARPs are from a lot of places. And we have people from Israel and Palestine and um, the Ukraine and countries that are in actual conflict. And, and an air raid alarm means something very different to an Israeli player than to a Finnish player, for instance. And, and that's something that's like an example that I unfortunately learned through not having thought of it in advance. So I hadn't specifically said, we often also use something called an ingredient list with specific things that might be triggering or that people might need to know about in advance. I don't know if you have occult horror, okay, blasphemy might be a theme of this LARP to a lot of Europeans. That's not a big thing, but to some players, very big thing. And then you don't want to play that LARP, whatever it is. Air raid sirens. Now, if I'd make a LARP with an air raid siren for an international audience, Honestly, for any audience, because we have people with so many backgrounds in all of our countries, I would put that on the list, just so you know, because to most people, it's totally okay to play inside a fiction where an air raid siren will go off at some point, as long as they know that it's going to happen, so that they can be mentally prepared and they know that it's going to be that thing. To kind of ramp us out of this conversation, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of bleed, where a player's mm -hmm. life spills over into their character or vice versa. And how do you handle that transition between yourself and your character? Well, I feel like my understanding of this has changed a lot over the years. And also the sort of community level understanding, the academic understanding of this is also developing still. There is some really good research that we can point you at in the show notes to, to learn more about bleed in a sort of much more in-depth in a theoretical sort of way. And of course, when you role play, you always use yourself, like you use stuff from your own life inevitably, because you, you only have the conceptual tools you have, you can only imagine what you can imagine. So of course, you're working with yourself the whole time. But usually when we talk about bleed, what we mean is some stuff that I didn't intentionally put in there rose to the surface, I was playing this character. And something resonated with something in my experience and some interesting, yeah, some interesting resonance or emotion came to the surface. Something meant something to me as a player that it wouldn't have meant to another person in the exact same situation in playing the exact same character. And that can be surprising, uh, of course, and pow or powerful, or it can be sometimes, yeah, you can like, of course, like in any situation, also in real life, you might be triggered by something that just like you would in any everyday interaction, if that trigger was present, that can of course also happen here. I'm not very alarmed by that in the context of our work, because we do tend to have so many mechanisms in place to be able to get yourself out of situations. So it's actually harder in real life to do sometimes than in these fictional settings. But very often, of course, the bleed between your life and the character is aesthetically powerful and it gives meaning to the experience because you're using it actively then somehow to shape your journey in relationship in some manner to the thing towards it or away from it. And perhaps to explore some other nuances or some other aspects of some dynamic that, that is familiar to you from real life but that in this fictional context can get new meanings or even new resolutions. That similar types of tools are, of course, also used therapeutically in psychodrama and other measures. And if we go all the way back to, to like 1910, when the term role-playing sort of originates in the tense, it is the same source. There are historical roots between all of these practices that are shared. I personally don't believe that you should use Nordic LARP therapeutically, at least not as some kind of replacement for actual clinical help. Designed for that, it's not 
particularly good at that. And also there's a massive consent issue uh, with your co-players who, who are not participating in some event for your therapeutic purposes. That said, this is when it comes to things like trauma. Of course, so many people have LARPed and then talked about how the LARP experience has changed their perspective or made them overcome a phobia, for instance. People who were not able to do public speaking suddenly found themselves able to do that in character. Then it's sort of the opposite. It's like, oh, I can't do public speaking, but I'm not me. And therefore, I suddenly have the social permission that goes so deep that even in my, you can fool your own nervous system to accept that you are, in fact, allowed and able to do public speaking. And that can bleed out. So that's the other direction of bleed is the things that are happening inside the fiction, which are not true, but are real. You really did speak in front of people. We really were a tight-knit group of friends who were fighting this epic dark force to save the world. And we even succeeded and almost nobody died. And when they did, it was very sad. And we went through this journey together. It wasn't true, but it was real in the sense that we were feeling those feelings as it was happening. And some of that's going to bleed out, of course. And that's lovely. You're going to end up with a lot of trust. And sometimes you learn things about yourself that you didn't want to learn. And then it can be hard to deal with. Playing oppressors, for instance, is very important, I think, to do if you consider yourself a good person, because it's going to teach you how it's possible for pretty normal people to do horrible things. You're going to have to figure out what in a person's mind would allow them or what in a situation would allow you to do something. And that's a horrible thing to learn. And you might feel sad about it afterwards, knowing that you probably yourself are also not immune to these things, but it's going to make you more immune. Having this insight is going to make you better at dealing with those kinds of situations in real life. So we won't bleed in both directions, inwards and outwards, because it's one of the things that gives role playing any kind of role playing meaning. But we also want to protect ourselves from like rampant emotional travel in each direction. And that's when we're back to that magic circle and why it's so important. And it's just very helpful to have a really clear boundary for who are we out of character? Who are we in character? You know, again, play some music at the beginning and the end. Maybe there's a physical boundary when you go through this door. We start the LARP. When we meet here again, then it's over, whatever it is. It's, you can ritualize some of those things to make it psychologically clearer to yourself. It's just very helpful. I really encourage for any kind of intense experience to have people meet out of character before for quite some time. You can also use that time to onboard them, to give them the tools and the trust that they need to be able to do the thing. But really, it's also an investment in moving out of character at the end, because then they can reconnect to the people they met at the beginning and now the relationship to them will have changed. But instead of hanging my love or my sense of brotherhood or my epic loss on a fictional person that I can never interact with, again, because they don't even exist, I can have those emotions in the context of a real human. And we can talk about the interaction that we had afterwards so we can put a little bow on it. And that is uh, easier and better. What are you working on now? What comes next for you? Oh... LARP specifically, we're running, there's a, a beautiful piece of erotic horror specifically by Torsetti Ledland and Danny Wilson and uh, Bjarke Pedersen that is very queer and very physical and very awful and probably nobody's first Nordic LARP. I wouldn't recommend it, but it ran before the pandemic and it's a very beautiful design. It's a ghost story about a house that sort of eats its inhabitants, basically. You never live and you play a family that lives in this, in this haunted house and the house imposes its will on them. And then the next day, you are now the ghosts and a new set of players comes in and plays the family. And then uh, it goes on like this for a week. So you get to play both the house and the inhabitants as part of the experience. And that has been very powerful. And that's coming back next summer for one run, one week run. What else? Uh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Yes. We have a really big new IP that we're launching. For a moment there, I forgot because everything has been put on hold for so long because of the pandemic. You can I imagine can we can't. Our work does not work. Well, none of us. Oh, my God. Yes. We were working on this new sort of story world that is designed to be optimized for the kinds of things we're interested in in LARP. Again, like a really kick-ass team, Johanna Pettersson, who was working on uh, Parliament of Shadows and a lot of the vampire things, and also actually was working on Fifth Edition, Bjarke Pedersen, uh, who is our creative director, and Trolls Barkholt, who we also work with a lot of the uh, vampire stuff, and myself have developed this LARP called The Wild Hunt. It's a series of LARPs that are all set in the, um, about human fey interactions, and it's an original IP because, yeah, working with licenses has its ups and downs. 
And we wanted to create something where the story world structure was optimized for the kinds of interactions that we're looking for. And there's some new things. There are independent smaller LARPs, and we've looked at designing them to, to be smaller so that they can be toured because we're starting to think very seriously about the climate impact of high profile events. And it's not feasible that our business model would be running events that people would be flying into from other continents. We're very privileged that happens. I'm very proud and, and grateful that people do. But it's not possible to have that at the core of a business. So we are looking at ways of creating fictions where you can participate in a nonlinear manner uh, or you can the LARP can come to you and maybe it's just 60 people or 100 people and then after some years, then people might travel together to a big event where more people, maybe let's say 500 people could be in the same place at the same time. But that wouldn't be a requirement for every event. And that's a sort of climate design test. Might not work at all, or it might be a complete game changer. We'll see. But I'm very excited about it because you can imagine how beautiful and dark and twisted a fey world can be when it's done right. And I believe we're doing it right. Very excited. Sounds like fun. Where can people find you on social media? I'm Yoxy on Twitter, J-O-C-X-Y, but we all know what's been happening to the Twitters in the last years, so I'm not there super much, but it's like an old love that I can't give up. It's, it's horrible. Yeah, I, I guess that would be the best channel, and I'll try to have some links in for other places as we go. Thank you so much, Johanna. This has been delightful. Thank you very much. The Reality Escape Pod is produced by Lisa Spira, Edited by Steve Ewing of Stand Inside Media and brought to you by RoomEscapeArtist.com, your home for well-researched, rational, and reasonably humorous escape room and immersive gaming content and events. I'd like to take a minute to talk to y'all from the heart. PG and I put a lot into making all of these episodes, as do the team that is off microphone. My wife, Lisa, Steve, our editor, put a ton into producing this podcast. All of this is made possible because of the support from our Patreon community. That financial support allows us to invest in the production value of what we're making and allows us to inch our way towards making this into a proper career. It's hard to monetize content these days, and our Patreon community really does allow us to do that and we're really trying to grow. So we put out extra bonus episodes for our patrons. We have a spoilers club for higher level backers. We've got a Discord chat, and we're always adding new things to the mix for our patrons. So if you love what we're doing, please consider supporting us. It means more than you could ever imagine. And you get a whole bunch of extra content too. Thank you again to all our patrons. If you aren't one, I hope you become one. The way Inside Hamlet ends is in the last hour and a half, two hours, a lot of the characters, two thirds of them had died. And what happens when you die is, is you're dead and you're lying dead in the set until somebody sees that, that there's a dead person there and they put you in a stretcher and they carry you to the chapel. And then there's a sort of secret back door out of the chapel and you can go down to the basement. And in the basement, you would be met by a person, in this case, usually me, who would check in with you and see if you're okay and you have you give you some snacks and, uh, and some soft drinks and and a hug if you need it, and an opportunity to have your picture taken, perhaps, if you feel like that, and a, a moment to breathe. But then, of course, the event isn't over, and what it's possible to do then, because it's, again, because it's thematically coherent, it's possible to do in this work, is that you can put on this sort of black veil and re-enter uh, the set as the ghost of your character, and then you are able to physically haunt people, and you can maybe even whisper in your ear, you can't otherwise, their ear, but you, that you can't otherwise interact with them. And at the very end, it, it ends the way the play ends, this uh, bell talk so it always happens when these sort of meta scenes and soliloquies are, are happening. So people gather around and then the final scenes of the play um, are playing out. This very complicated duel at the end of Hamlet. Basically, at that point, almost everybody is dead. But of course, some people are still alive in the set. And I think it's Horatio who says the last words. And at this point, Fortinbras comes in. And in this fiction, of course, they're revolutionaries, right? So they come in with, so there's some like socialist people with like red flags and guns. And they line the survivors up against the wall. And everybody has been briefed very carefully about this, that this is what's going to happen. What's going to happen at the end of the LARP is if your character is still alive, when Fortinbras enters, 
hunters, you will all be lined up against the wall and he will pick some people out, possibly, so for plot reasons, and then the others uh, will be shot. The, the lights will go down and you will hear the shots and, and that's your, you are being executed. And the rule is that if your character deserves to live, you remain standing. And if they deserve to die, you fall. And this is, it's weird, like I get goosebumps. I've seen this so many times and I've played it a couple of times. It's a very powerful design. And people believe, because sometimes some of these characters are pretty innocent and they go in and they're like, well, I am actually a good person. Like this character will survive to the end. And then they have been so corrupted by that machine of horror that they've been in for three months inside the fiction that a lot of them actually do choose, choose to die. So very typically there will be like maybe six characters out of maybe a hundred surviving at the end. And this is very powerful and very moving. And when the shots, you know, are fired, there's two seconds of quiet and then the, the music starts. And somebody who was in that line felt it was a good idea to slightly speechify at the very end to show some kind of rebellion. And also like, I mean, don't do that if in a piece you're messing up the pacing. So like, don't do even a tiny little speech, don't do that. But in particular, do not under any circumstances <laughs> take your champagne glass and crush it on the ground where you know for a fact that everybody standing around you is going to fall dead in two seconds. That is not a good player decision. And this is, it's been, it's, it is, has haunted me. Nothing bad happened, and, but it's just, I felt a little bit robbed of my, like the moment of the finale, because all the ghosts have come up and I've been outside of the play area for most of the thing, because I'm running the out of character room and I'm finally allowed to be inside the set. And we're standing there in our ghost veils and this beautiful moment is happening. And the only thing I can think about it is, is I got to get that glass off the floor and God, I hope nobody sits in it. And why would you choose to do that? And I, and I, That's a yeah, Leroy wow. Jenkins move. That was such a Leroy Jenkins move. <laughs> <laughs>